All right, so Huygens' principle. You guys have probably noticed that if you play in the bathtub long enough, you'll notice that when you make a splash, there are ripples. And Huygens probably noticed the same thing, although whether it was in the bathtub or not, I really don't know. I mean, I don't know how he, how he bathed. That's beside the point. Um, for, for Huygens' principle to, to start off, we might want to talk about the fact that there are wave fronts moving along, and you know those are the ripples that we often notice. You might notice them actually not so much in the bathtub, you'd be more obvious at the ocean, right? You know, these successive waves that wash up on the shore, these ripples. And we talk about a wave vector uh, that's at right angles to the wave front, and that would be the direction in which these wave fronts are traveling. And in the space in between the wave fronts, uh, we might label up as being lambda. That's the wave length, the distance between the crests, the successive crests. And we might also talk about the speed of a wave. So there might be a, a C value. Well, I'm using C because in my mind I'm thinking of light. But you might use V more generally for, for wave speed. In this case, we'll talk about C because it's light that we really want to talk about today anyway. Um, and we can also even talk about frequency. But frequency would just be a function of C over lambda. So, you know, whether we're talking about speed or wavelength or frequency, really it's all part of the same conversation. It's just talking about the waves that are propagating as wave fronts. Now, this is where Huygens comes in. Huygens says, you know what, it's not just a simple front. It's not quite as, as uh, straightforward as that, maybe. Huygens conceptualized a wave front as being made up of a whole bunch of individual point sources for a wave. And I want to get at what a point source for a wave might be. You know, if you drop a pebble, into a pond, you would, that would be a point source for a wave. And the wave would go out in concentric circles. And there's nothing really radical about that. And you would know that for that wave, it would have a wavelength. So that each concentric circle would be some consistent distance apart. We talk about it as lambda. You know, it would be one wavelength apart. That's how these crests would represent themselves as they propagate outwardly from the, the, the point source of the wave. So it shouldn't be so crazy to think about if a wave is really made up of a whole bunch of point sources. And you know, in the case of water, you might think of each point source as being one uh, water molecule bobbing up and down. So if a water molecule bobs up and down, it would make a ripple. And that's what happens when water waves go forward. And if each individual point source makes a ripple, you notice that all these semicircles are centered on the point sources that I described. Each individual point source makes a, a ripple, and we only consider the ripple on the right-hand side as the wave is traveling in that direction. Then what you would probably notice is that if I drew a tangent across the leading edge of each of those ripples, you'd get what's called, commonly called the wave front. And then if along that wave front there was another bunch of point sources, we would reconceptualize that wave front as another bunch of point sources, we could then draw concentric circles, or sorry, not concentric circles, semicircles around them, each being offset lambda in length from the point source. And then if we drew a tangent to those leading edges, Oh, that's not a very good tangent to the leading edges. But we'd, we'd get a wave front. And, you know, my scale is a little bit off. I should have made these guys be the same distance apart as these guys. I haven't represented it quite accurately. But the idea is that all these wave fronts are equally spaced. And every wave front is generated by a bunch of point sources. Can you swallow that? And Huygen. I'm saying Huygen because I'm an English speaker. But really it's pronounced Huygen or something like that. I'm sorry. I, I just... I'm too ignorant and set in my ways to reform my way of saying it. It's really Huygen or, or some pronunciation. Uh, it's, I'm going to say Huygen because that's just, I'm sorry, I'm ignorant. Um, but Huygen, he, he was kicking around, this was actually postulated around 1678. So we think about this whole idea of um, little uh, particles making quantum waves or something like that as being something that's really new. I mean, this isn't quantum physics. But it, it's one of those things that leads people to thinking about quantum physics. This is old stuff. This is, I mean, this is 300 years before I was born. I was born in 1978. 1678, that's a long time ago. And people are borrowing on his ideas and calling it modern physics. I mean, modern is relative, right? I mean, we're not rubbing sticks together here. But 
it was old. This is old stuff. This is a while ago. And then somewhere in the, uh, the early 1800s, around 1801 to 1804, a guy named Thomas Young came along, and Thomas Young came up with this idea that we've been talking about previously, the Young's double slit experiment. Thomas Young was a really neat kind of guy. Um, you guys are familiar with what Egyptology is, right? It's the study of Egyptian stuff. And Europeans were, were really keen on Egyptology for a while. And <coughs> some people are really keen on it still. But Thomas Young, the same guy that did uh, Young's double slit experiment and, and a number of other things, actually. He was really prolific in the sciences. Uh, also was a huge Egyptologist. And he's the one that cracked the Rosetta Stone. You guys ever heard of Rosetta Stone? Not the software company for learning language, but it, it was like a, a stone that had a, a whole bunch of different languages on it, um, and they all, all had the same thing written on it, but in different languages. And he already spoke like 16, 17 languages of uh, current, present, living languages. And so he had a, a pretty robust understanding of language, and he cracked the Rosetta Stone. And he also uh, came up with Young's double slit experiment. So I mean, this is a pretty bright guy. Um, I mean, even Einstein praised him in, in uh, some treatise or letter, I can't remember what he was writing about, talking about Young as being a genius. So I, I mean, this is a guy well respected by people that we already respect as geniuses, uh, but maybe not emphasized very well in our classrooms to talk about really how amazing they are. Like these are, these are bright people, okay? Really true Renaissance people. Many languages, sciences, the arts, all the, the whole package, you know? R real, uh, real fancy stuff. Anyhow, um, what happens next, I think, is kind of interesting. And this is Huygens' idea. Oh, I should... Thomas Young. We'll get to Thomas in just a second. Let's talk about Huygens for a second. Huygens, sorry. Um, if this wave finds its way to a barrier... Now, not all of the points are going to smack into that barrier. Let's say that one of the points smacks into the barrier. What's the wave going to look like coming out the other side? I mean, some people might be tempted to say, OK, here's a barrier. This is what it's going to look like. It starts off going through the barrier. It goes like this. Wave fronts going this way, coming out the other side. It's going to look like this. And those people would be wrong. So you tell me, what should it look like coming out the other side of the, that barrier? spread outwards, yeah. Actually, it does spread outwards. And so people talk about this sort of a shape possibly coming out the other side. Can you see why they would say that? Because of a single point source causing a, a wave front to come through there, and then it would fringe outwards. Now, if the, if the spacing, the gap is bigger, then it, it tends to be rounded at the edges. And you might conceptualize that as saying, let's say that three point sources got through, and so the center one contributes to maybe like a, a flat portion in the middle. And the two on the edges contribute to rounding off on the, on the edges. We call that a diffraction effect, you know, the, the rounding off on the edges of the wave that propagates out the other side of this thing. Now, here's something that's kind of neat from this, a consequence. Now, these spaces should be lambda apart still, because the wavelength hasn't changed. Each of these concentric semicircles, lambda apart. But if I take a wall, and say this is an L-shaped wall, and I poke a hole in it, that's a hole in the wall. And these concentric circles, semicircles, keep on going out, keep on going out, keep on going out, keep on going out, keep on going out. At this point here, where the wave smacked into the wall, what happens on the other side of the wall in this region here? If one point source bobs up and down in that hole, another semicircle. Isn't that wild? It's like you're getting it to turn a corner, right? And this is the way people actually see things. And you can sort of imagine this. If this was a water tank, if this was a water tank, you can imagine that sort of a thing happening. Or maybe you can't. But I, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you some inkling. But yeah, it does sort of happen that way. OK. Um, now the, the other side of this is that, or the other part of this, is that it doesn't just have to be a single slit because, you know, I've mentioned Jung, so I'll carry on with talking about Jung. Um, Jung says, why talk about just one opening when we could talk about two? Okay, 
So if I have my wave fronts coming along, and these wave fronts smack into those two openings, and sure, we can still talk about all the many, many point sources. In fact, some people don't just say many, many. They say virtually an infinite number of point sources creating that wave front. Because the more point sources you have that you th you're thinking of here conceptually, the more smooth the wave front becomes. There's a smoothing effect. So if we consider it to be infinite point sources, that's very convenient for us, okay? So an infinite number of point sources, and let's say that a small subset of infinite, of infinite point sources gets this point, and that acts as a point source, and we've talked already about what, that hap what happens on the other side. You get these concentric circles. The red ones are gonna be the concentric circles that are being represented, or are representing the ripples coming out from the one opening, and I'll do a green one waves that are coming out from the other opening. And where reds cross with greens, we talk about having constructive interference bands. And we've talked previously about the fact that on some screen or some, some wall further down, you would get some sort of a constructive destructive interference pattern on that wall, okay? With brightness as being represented by peaks and darkness as being represented by troughs. And it's all about constructive and destructive interference but really, this stuff here is related back to what happens at the slit. So it's Young standing on the shoulders of Huygen. Okay, so we're always having this conversation. And this is kind of neat because it's, you know, we're, we're taking a, a real quick snapshot, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, snapshot to, to view a conversation that, that maybe spanned a, a couple hundred years. You know, that's the way it is in the science classroom. We, we watch conversations from the outside unfold that happened over a, over a period of a few hundred years sometimes. Sometimes it's only over a few decades, sometimes it's only over a century, but this is a long conversation and people are still having the conversation. 